can see how untidy my study is at the moment. Hi, Sue. Hi, Mary. I can hear you. You sound great. <laughs> you should know what I sound like after all my talking in my presentation. Yes, I watched it several times, too. Poor you. <laughs> I, sorry, I need to mute. Sorry about that, Judith. <laughs> Sorry, I had two going. I was hearing Judith. She's she's starting her talk, uh, her Q&A from her talk. It's hard. I want to see everything, don't you? Exactly. That's why the catch-up ones have been really good because I watched them all last the, today. I, I got to bed about 2 o'clock this morning and I was thinking, oh, all right, I'll <laughs> wake up whenever. And I actually woke up at 8 o'clock. Oh, I know perfect. That, but I'd had, according to my watch, I'd actually had an hour and a half of deep sleep, which is more deep sleep than I've had for a long time. So, nice. so I, woke up and I actually felt all right. Awesome. So, good. Well, credit the crabs. <sighs> you see how green my sub is at the moment? Mine is too. You can't really tell from this angle, but yeah, is the sunlight coming in? Is that your issue? Yeah. Or so I've got a double glass door and that's, I usually have the curtains open just to let the light in. I mean, there's a big window behind, but I don't open those curtains at all. Yeah, I, you know, there's been a lot of debate. I, I leave it until I can't take it anymore. Then if I know no one's down there, I usually just rub right against the glass. And, um. uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're down. I haven't seen either of the adults since April. Well, and it's cold weather for you now, right? So well, now, well, it's winter, but, I mean, I still haven't got a jumper on and it's half past midnight. Yeah. I haven't had a jumper on all night, all day. So, um the last couple of nights, though, have been very cold. Um, so, Christy, what do you want to know? We are still waiting on uh, several people. Uh, Kelsey, are you going to come on screen? I, I, you know, I think it's easiest if everyone can. I think maybe you had issues and couldn't. Um, Helena's hey, coming. Hi. Um, who else do we have? Dan. Uh, 
Hi. Should probably be coming. Moa's coming. Yeah, the gang's all here. <laughs> the breeding <laughs> gang. Uh, Tammy, I believe, was going to um, attempt to get online, I mean, on camera with us. So let me just adjust mine a little. So we should have uh, a full compliment. Hi, Moa. Hi. Hey, Helena, I'll turn the main light on. <laughs> I've only got the one light here. I'm in the dark. Oh, it's mine. <laughs> it's mood lighting. It is. <laughs> when I, I was um, chatting with Helena earlier tonight and I just had this light on, I had the main light off and so I was sort of, <laughs> Um. Let me check who else we are waiting on just because I'm having trouble keeping it all straight. Stacy Bolts was having issues. Um, she yeah. had storms overnight and um, her internet was knocked out. They said they couldn't get there till this afternoon. I have a private message. Let me see who that is. Stacy's here, Mary, um, but she's using her phone, she says. Who is Stacy. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, great. So she'll be here for typing. Yeah. Oh, that was that message was from you, Helena. All right. So anyone who wants to ask us questions should be in the sessions chat stream. And I don't know if Dan is going to be here, but if he pops in, we'll just uh, go from there. So what I wanted to do was just we'll just go clockwise and just you know, introduce ourselves. Most people know, say what species you've uh, attempted or successfully attempted or however many times, you know, like whatever you want your information to be. So Mary Akers started in 2017, realizing there was a thing <laughs> of mating and eggs. Um, I guess I found that out in 2016, tried in 2017, succeeded in 2018 and 2019. I've had more than a thousand um, come to land. They've all been Clypeatus. I thought at first I had some Compressus, but I didn't. Um, and then this new batch are mysterious and we don't know. We're hoping probably either Viola or Perlatus are the best guesses, but I'm hoping to get help identifying them from you, Moa, especially um, when I get some good close-ups. So Sue, you want to you wanna go next? Um, Sue Brown, I'm from Australia. Um, I had an attempt in 2000, January 2016, yeah, 2016, and then again in December 2016. Um, wasn't successful in the first go, and the second go I got 26 to land, and out of those I have two left that are now three and a half years old. I didn't even and know I had a crab with eggs until I saw stuff in my salt pool and I went, oh, my Lord. So I thought, <laughs> what now? I'm going to find this out in my talk tomorrow night, or tomorrow morning. Which is wonderful, yeah. by the way. Yeah. I had a sneak peek. <laughs> Elena, you want to introduce yourself? Um, so I have had an attempt uh, in 2019 and the start of this year as well. Uh, I wasn't successful with my two attempts, but I'm hoping, you know, as I learn more from you guys, you know, I'll get closer to getting some success. But that, that's with Aussies. And the, the strawberries have been um, displaying mating, you know, wanting to mate and um one of them just you know walks off halfway through so it hasn't hasn't gone anywhere yet you got to megalopa didn't you yes i did yeah i was thinking yeah. that's the, that's that transition is so hard for so many people getting past yeah. that um yeah. moa <laughs> yeah can you hear me yeah perfect good um i got baby's first in 2011 um, and after that I lost my female and now I have several females who get babies all the time <laughs> uh, or eggs at least. Uh, I haven't 
been able to to get them uh, further than their first malt. But I hope to succeed in the, in the future. Are um, your Sragosis? Is that yes. what or Breviman? Yeah. Yeah. And you uh, have did you have brevimanus eggs too or not that eggs was maybe mating behavior but not not eggs yet gotcha. um tammy if you want to type and introduce you can if i know you're struggling she said she was struggling to get uh, on camera we can also wait and just you know put her on the spot then sorry just kidding we, we won't make you um so yeah maybe we can look at the questions um scroll down i will pin questions to the top if i think someone hasn't seen it so so also check the top um kelsey you should come on screen you should we're none of us are presentable here i'll mess my hair up how's that okay <laughs> so we're not looking pretty either <laughs> Come on in the dark. Just let us hear your voice. You can, you can, you can, if you, if you don't want to be on camera, but you're okay to speak, you can come on and stop your video and we'll still hear you. Um, that's an option for anyone who uh, is camera shy. So mating season for hermit crabs. Well, Regan, that depends on the species in my experience. Um, I think the uh, folks down under, um see it do you see it in the warmer months right yeah, yeah. we do so um, the my ones in particular it's november until april yeah that's the mating season well i i sort of sometimes october november um, yeah. and i will say the summer storms tend to be when ours decide to release their eggs yeah both of my lots were released on very stormy hot humid um lightning everywhere um nights and natalie from south australia has said the same thing with hers she had um all the eggs were released during stormy evenings yeah that happened with my first lot it was on a stormy night that the first lot were released and then the the most recent attempt was halfway between a week of storms so it was I think it's that activity in the atmosphere, maybe. It's probably a safer time in the wild to spawn. Yeah. If you think about it, you know. Yeah. Uh, my clypeatus are very reliable. Um, September and October, I usually get two spawns out of them. So sometimes the end of August, but usually the breeding happens at the beginning of August and the spawning happens in um, September. And then there's a second wave in October. And I've had that for four years now, very uh, reliably. I don't know about the exotics because they're just starting to get comfortable. Uh, I've had straw mating behavior. I had it starting, interestingly enough, I had it starting in what would be the warm months for you all, um, mm. like January, but was very cold here. So I just wonder if they're still sort of on this schedule, even though they're in the Northern Hemisphere now and, and very far north. But so um, always and yours, Moa, is there a, is there a, it's I all the time, right? All the time. I, <laughs> I have no specifics. They always do it. That was the sense I got. <laughs> All year round. Um, Stacy Bolts, I believe, with her, she gets mostly Ecuadorian eggs, as far as I know, and those I think are just like sort of like your Ragosis Moa. They're just like all the time she's all the time going, "Oh my God, I'm at Zoe. <laughs> you just had Zoe. Yes, I know." How many? Uh, compresses do you have, Stacy? Uh, that that would be interesting because I only have two, and so I, they, you know, I don't have that opportunity. I don't think. Yeah, there's a lag a little bit. I pinned a question to the top. You guys can be thinking about if you have answers. I'm a long way from having strawberry eggs. To let a strawberry to land because I don't even have any yet. <laughs> <laughs> They're about $80 over here. 
Oh yeah, they're so expensive. Wow. Yeah, my are, are they protected? They yes. are protected with a limited import. Every four years, they're allowed to um, distribute. I think it's a hundred strawberry hermit crabs not, not throughout really. Australia, and that's it. I have seen get on straws in the wild though on Lady oh, Alice. That's so cool. That's awesome. And they were in wow. and around the roots of the she oak trees. Oh, really? Yep, that's where they were hiding. Oh, on an island, the very southernmost oh, island of the Barrier Reef. Um, they were probably 100 metres from the beach, uh, from the... Oh, wow. Super and it's close. very... Uh, Lady Elliot Island's very um, coarse coral sand. There's mm. no... Um, white soft silica sand it's all just crushed coral there's um and even the the um land where the trees grow is very well drained and you wouldn't think, I, think, I think the straws there don't burrow so much because it's there's no way known that it would hold tunnels or anything like that so i think they actually go into the hollows in the in amongst the like the trees have lots of roots and they go up in under the trees and in hollows of trees there were eight nine ten of them in one in one hollow in one tree it was just and it was all these straws and then oh, i wanted to put them in my bag and take them home i had a very large straw like that with shell about that big that was donated last year to the breeding program and he molted in the moss pit i mean he had 12 mm. inches of sand but i had an elevated moss pit successfully nobody bothered him he had a good molt he ate all his exo it was really interesting i was worried i thought you know i kept peeking every couple of days and that seemed to be where he was most comfortable You've got so you may have something, and maybe the bigger they are, the harder even to find a good underground space. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how close I am getting them to land. I have them mating. I've had them mating before. The problem seems to be for me uh, the spawning. The straws that I have have never gotten the Zoe into the water, and I haven't been able to find them. And I think I've had maybe three, uh, three times with eggs. It's my personal philosophy to, to, to make the crabs do their part. I'm not going to find them and stick them in the water. I'm not, I just, I just, I want this to be a cooperative effort and maybe that sounds woo woo and silly, but, um, I'm not trying to breed them in that sense. I'm, if they gift me with eggs, and they hatch and they're viable. I want to help them make their babies survive. But it is a misnomer in my case to say, and probably all our cases, to say we're we're breeding crabs. We're not. The crabs are breeding, they're giving us babies. Then we either flush them, pour them down the sink, or give it our best shot. Yeah, flat out, out here going, oh, my God, what are we going to do? That's why I'm grey. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> so let's see if there are other questions. What do you feed McDreamy, Elena? Pardon? What do you feed McDreamy? Oh my goodness, everything. It, he is the one that gets all of the food and everyone else has to just sort of get the scraps. But he goes nuts at anything, any flowers. So dandelions, uh, roses, got hibiscus, all that sort of stuff he goes crazy for it. But he also loves mushrooms and um, what's the other thing that he loves? Liver of all things. I dehydrate liver and he goes crazy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I think that's what my, my big male loves. Duck liver. Really like. loves it. Yeah, freeze. Yeah. I have freeze dried, and he, yeah. if there's a chunk, he sneaks it or tucks it into his pants, or 
here you come, Tammy. You're coming. Sorry. We see I, you. <laughs> I'm so sorry, we're technologically challenged here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think you're not alone. We uh, we were all struggling. I asked Dan if he would come on. Oh, forgot to hit send. Dan, if you can come on, and we'll have all six. And um, and Kelsey, you're still welcome to join if you can figure it out. It'll just keep adjusting us. I'm getting so, feedback from you, Mary. It's not me. I closed that. I did have some going, but I have since closed it. So um, it's not me. But if right. anyone has another tab open and you can hear something, you might be getting uh, you might be getting that coming through your speaker and coming into ours. Mm -hmm. But um, since we did the intros, um, Dan and Tammy, would you all mind just saying a little bit about you know your attempt or success and when it was and what species? Sure. I mean, do you want to go first, Dan? You go right ahead. Oh uh, sure. Uh, well, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, well, uh, last year. Uh, I had my strawberries and just randomly a few days before CrabCon, I happened to see uh, my biggest male Mephistopheles on top of uh, one of the females. And I was like, oh, I believe they're mating. So I posted that to Mary on the, uh, I forget what page it was, but she was, like, yes, that's what it appears like. And I checked and I've, I had eggs and it happened to be just before uh, crab con. So then I, I took the female Abby up to Mary in order to help her uh, along with her breeding process. So Mary actually has Abby now. And then after con, we got several more meetings, which uh, Mephistopheles was mating with uh, one of the females and they actually successfully spawned in water, which I'll go now on YouTube and try to find that picture and because I caught an awesome video of it. So I'll post. It's incredible. And that was just my thing. And I'm like, oh my God, I have these strawberry zo zoea. I'm totally not prepared. Mary help. What do I do? And she gave me assistance trying to get a makeshift set up. And I believe they lasted maybe seven to 10 days before I lost them all. Watch my video, Dan. That's exactly what I'm all about. Yeah, but uh, I'll pop now and find those videos. And I actually have a few, I think, of the strawberry zoea in the water as well. So I'll, cool. I'll pop off quick and put the links uh, in the chat. Okay. And Tammy? Well, I have been trying for years and years with um, varied levels of success and always ended up losing them. And then finally in 2009, I had um, what I thought were Cenobita purpureus, and it turned out actually that they're C. lila. And I was successful with them first in February, and then um, had my Clypeatus uh, that I was successful with that summer. So it was definitely a challenge. And, Several dozen. Oh, pardon me? Several dozen successful of each. Right? Yeah, but that isn't that many really when when it's all said and done, not enough to do it commercially. More than my right. two, I got left. But it was so difficult. It was super time consuming. Um, obviously it was a labor of love, <laughs> but not one that I was ready to do after that because it was just so, it was impractical, impractical to do, you know, along with owning a business and having a life and all that. Yeah. One of the things I think that it, it is hard to convey, and since we have people watching, we have 32 in here who are, I'm assuming, are interested in giving it a go. I think one of the, the parts of it that is um, that we don't talk about because, well, 
for the obvious reason probably, is the emotional toll it takes. Yeah. I think you can all agree there's this constant, uh, you're just trying so hard to keep them alive, trying to figure out what they need, what you're doing wrong, is this right, is that right? And it goes on and on and on. I mean, it goes on for month or more, depending on the species, um, plus the physical toll of changing water and you know just being there for all the food changes um so that's not to dissuade anyone it's just to prepare you you think you're prepared you think you understand <laughs> the toll <laughs> am i right like back me up folks yeah, yeah. the highs are highs and the lows are lows <laughs> Good, even good. I, I could not even fathom doing it for as long as you guys have to. Our guys spend about two weeks in the water, and that's way longer. <laughs> that's, that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and you want that to give them everything, so you'd want you really try. Sorry, Dan. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it was just difficult, especially. I mean, for everything that you learn from Mary with everything that she posts and help, like until you actually try to do it yourself and you're in there sucking out all the zoea from the dirty water, trying to pick them out and I dropper them in one at a time into another container. It's hours upon hours. And plus like with me, I have a regular eight hour a day job. So you're trying to do your normal work, figure out your time to try to feed them and do the water changes. And it's like, well, I never tried this before. I would love to do it for a shot, but I'm gonna give it my best until there's nothing more to give. And it's just kind of depressing when you go through that for weeks and there's nothing and then it's just done. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's hard. The failures are, uh, they're not failures. I hate to even call them failures because it all advances the pool of knowledge. It takes us farther. Um, but uh, it feels like a failure when you're the one that's doing it and attempting it. And uh, yeah, just be kind to yourself because we're all learning and we're all experimenting and trying. Um, one of the things with my multiple attempts that I've come to think is the, the one of the main issues in the early uh, deaths is um, not removing the molts from the water. Um, if you have mold, if you're trying to keep hundreds or more, and they go through a shed and all of those sheds are then drifting through the water and fouling the water. They're largely invisible to the naked eye unless you've got a very strong light. And uh, and I think that's also why a traditional chrysal doesn't work because it has that fil filter, you know, that filter screen and those sheds are so light and they're so, they, they collect and they clog it and then you have issues. And so this is the next thing for us to figure out from my point of view. Uh, does someone have something playing in their background that their speaker is picking up um, I think that you can do? Dan's um, microphone keeps going green. Oh, mine does? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I remember. Have another tab open playing or something in the background or oh. television or something. Uh, that, that's actually down. Let me check. Maybe from YouTube. Oh, probably. Um, Thank you. It's not, it's not a deal breaker, but it is distracting. Yeah, uh, I don't. I, there's an air conditioner next to me. I wonder maybe the air from that might be. Um, yeah. Let me that. mute you. Don't take offense. I'll mute okay. you and I'll see if it goes away. 
uh, that goes away for me. Uh, you guys, I don't think it matters for you because you have to mute him yourself. But yeah, it's definitely something on your end, Dan. I've unmuted you, so we can troubleshoot if you want, or um, okay, a I'm phone or something. Yeah, there, there's like nothing playing here. Like, like there's no audio. Just I have a air conditioner on. No okay, that's all right. We'll but, just we'll soldier on. Um, I'm hearing myself. I think echoed back yeah. from your. You have different speakers from your webcam or something, and they're picking them up. But anyway, um, who would like to take the question? How does the swimming ability of newly hatched larvae compare to larval shrimps and true crabs? Does anyone have a, an answer for that? Well, I can I can sort of address it. I, not necessarily about larval shrimps and true crabs, but those first, so Clypeatus are the ones I'm most familiar with, and those very first larvae to me swim like mosquito larvae. They're very jerky. They're not particularly um, good at what they do. They're just kind of getting through the water and staying afloat. As they go through different stages, as they get swimmerettes and and other appendages and just learn, I guess, they get a lot more adept. They will avoid my siphon. They will go after food. I can tell they're much more purposeful, but the very first day, they don't know what they're doing. They're just learning. And some of this will be obvious in Tammy's wonderful um, video too. I think you have some beautiful close-ups of the changing structures. Then yeah. maybe that's I mean, an, an explanation. The Aussies can't swim at all, and if you turn the air the air off, um, they will just sink to the bottom and they will die. Yeah, I saw that too. So they'll sink to the bottom, and they do that little mosquito wriggle to sort of get themselves floating again. But that's as as far as they sort of go with swimming until they reach megalopa, and that's where they become, you know, determined to do what they do, and they look for shells. And yeah. <laughs> or the Superman swim where they're just, yeah, you know. Yeah, the megalos are the cutest. <laughs> they are. Well, another thing that I discovered that really increased my success rate was unfathomably to me, the stage five were attacking brutally and cannibalizing the megalopa. Now you would think the yep. megalopa Lovely. with claws would be completely equipped to fight back, but all those dangly bits, or maybe they're just soft or a little paralyzed after that incredible molt. But once I, so I learned to on days when megalopa were starting to transition, I would turn the light on, I would feed them, and within a half an hour, boom, 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 they're everywhere. They change color, they're swimming differently, so they're very easy to find. And I, when I did my water change, instead of avoiding them, I picked out all the megalopa as I saw them change, you know, right up into the siphon, into the wastewater. Then I moved them into the transition tank. They were cannibalizing each other which is what I, yeah. all the things I have read was happening with megalopa. It was a stage five that were eating or just killing. And that may be a resource competition thing, you know, like babies trying to outcompete each other. If you can kill the one that gets the shell before you, maybe, I, I'm not sure what they're doing, but that was a huge, uh, change for me in, in terms of successes that I started having after I realized that. You guys had that same revelation? Well, with mine, I saw you it, was, it. it was the megalopa for me that would cannibalize the, the stage five. And of course, megalopa will go after each other as well. And I didn't see that. That's, that's what I thought. That's what I learned. That's what I was prepared for. I saw them fighting. It took me probably two attempts to realize that the fighting was not the Lopa, in my case, being eaten, uh, being doing the eating. It was the ones being eaten. So interesting. We found like the Aussies don't eat until they turn to Megalopa. 
they don't eat anything at all and then they eat each other in preference to just about anything I tried. They much prefer each other. Um, the only thing I found that worked was, uh, um, oh, I can't remember now. Um, it was a very fine grain, oh, beta um, powder. What is it? was salt, but it sunk. Beta, beta fish food. Oh, beta. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Did you try that, Helena, or did you not get to that stage? So what happened with mine was the stage two were often grabbing hold of the stage ones that hadn't quite transitioned yet. Yeah. Uh, and if any megalopa were still and eating, the stage two would grab a hold. And I would find that um, the soft part, you know, at the back of the head, don't know the science word there, but um, <laughs> that part would end up getting nibbled by the stage twos. So I found yeah. them to be a little bit more aggressive and the megalopa would eat the sinking pellets. Yeah. yeah. Did you try any other food? Yes, I tried the um, nanochloropsis, I think it's called. It's an algae. And I seemed to get, you know, a stronger malt from each of the stages because I added that uh, almost straight away. And, yeah, it seemed to make them stronger. I haven't been able to find that here. Yeah. Is that a live algae or is that more of a fish flake? It's live. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mentioned that in my talk though, for simpler methods because it it's food for them. It also helps to oxygenate the water better and it helps to use up nitrates. So um, I think there's a ton of advantages to it. I added it every day. I got that tip from... Um, Daniela in Germany who had uh, 24, which was this huge success. Um, so I was inspired to try that. I culture it now. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, it's in between the two tanks. It's, it's kind of washed out, but it's just a big growler, beer growler. And I buy Mercer of Montana brand um, nanochloropsis because I like it. It's very pure. They, they ship it quickly. And then you can buy a culture, um, you know, a, a, sorry, an aquatic fertilizer. And they tell you how to do it. And you just keep it warm and keep it lit. And um, then you have a ton. I mean, you can buy it, but it's expensive to keep buying it if you're adding it every day. Because when you're changing water out, you're also pulling out the nanochloropsis. Um, yeah which you don't want to do, but, you know, yeah. Well, that's good. I'm glad you found it helpful, you know. Yeah, it was really good. There was only one spot that I could find it at, um, and I was lucky to get it when I did. I'm guessing if you could find it powdered, you could culture it powdered eventually, like by adding it to salt water. Um, yeah. Just an option. Tammy, you were going to say something? Oh, I was just, one of my biggest problems was following the water with different food sources. So that would be a great way to avoid that problem, you know, because you have that. Yeah. Then. What I did is I, I fed, I fed and then left it for about half an hour. And then I did the water change after that. Yeah. So I fed about half an hour before I did each water change. So therefore I was getting a lot of the um, excess food out. Because once they started eating, they stop stop up stuff up really quickly, and half an hour was generally enough. And they sort of finished, and they were doing other stuff. And so then I did the water changes, and that tended to work fairly well for me. I think I got that tip from you, Sue. I do the same. I I feed them. Um, and then I would wait about a half hour and do uh, a water change. A lot of the things I fed would suspend for a certain amount of time, but eventually mm. would fall to the bottom, even in the chrysal. And so I would just take my little siphon and try to get what I could um, out of there. Uh, I started doing yeah, but I mean, we're all experimenting. Who was that, Moa? What was that? I do the same thing now because you told me. That's how it works, right? Share the knowledge. It was the same here as well. Like basically whatever Mary said I did or tried to. <laughs> <laughs> 
But don't forget to experiment because you'll you'll curve, you know improve on my methods by doing that. Yeah, it was just I was totally taken away by it, and I had to do a makeshift thing in mason jars in a ten gallon aquarium, and I basically had no idea. I saw them right before I left for work, so I shut off my filters i kept the bubbler on and my saltwater pool and i'm like well i gotta go to work i'll try to deal with this when i get home so then i had to run and buy quick supplies and rig stuff up so it was definitely totally unprepared on my part because mary was supposed to have all my eggs <laughs> i can totally sympathize I try. With ben. Mine stayed in the tap pool for probably two days at least, and I don't even know if it was longer than that because I don't know how long they'd been there before I noticed them. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not seeing any activity really with the strawberries. I did see a purple in a strawberry, which appeared to be mating the other day, but I don't know for sure. And I was like, that's very strange, but that tank has been totally bizarre this whole year. Like nobody's up from molts and unlike the last two years I've had them. How do you have a sense? I know you had a filter going, Dan, when yours when you first noticed the Zoe, but like because strawberry perlatus eggs are so large, do you have a good sense for how many zoe you ended up with, even maybe accounting for the filter? Uh, I'm trying to think when I caught them because I couldn't, I wasn't sure how long they were in there because uh, I, I checked on them right before work and I was like, whoa, there's, Two strawberries in there. Wait, why is the one holding? And when I saw the light and I saw all the little zoea, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. So then I would say I had maybe a thousand total when I started. So I don't know how many of those may have got sucked up into the filter beforehand, but I don't know, maybe I started with 8,000. I really don't know, but their their eggs appear rather large, though. Well, you saw the ones huge. That he had huge compared to see uh, Clypeatus. Yes. Um, so Darcy asked a question: Can you give an estimate in cost to bring babies to land? I want to hear what other people say. I don't want to answer that. <laughs> I've already answered in the um, chat. I reckon my setup cost me about fifty bucks. Yeah, I mean, I I had my 10-gallon aquarium, which I think we got from a rescue, so that was free. Air pump, a uh, couple mason jars, salt water, a a a uh, heat thing for inside the actual 10-gallon aquarium. That might have been ten, fifteen dollars. But I'm probably similar $50 to attempt it. But what I think is more expensive is buying all of the nano. And then I, I know uh, like brine shrimp eggs in order to hatch them. I think that's where most of your expenses will be. So you got water from the ocean, didn't you? For my first attempt, yeah. Um, because I've been using ocean water in my habitat to start with, and I figured that was what they spawned into. That was what they'd survive for two and a bit possible days in the tank. Um, so I kept on doing that. Um, the second lot, I used ocean water until about halfway through, and then I changed because it was just getting too difficult to keep the ocean water up because it's a half hour trip each way. Um, and I changed to red sea salt. I think, no, instant ocean. Yeah, no, red sea salt was I changed to. Um, 
but the first time I changed, I only did a a third change. So they had a third um, synthetic and two thirds ocean. One of the jars, though, I did a total change of uh, probably a, a greater than fifty percent change, and they nearly all died. Um, I don't know if it was that or if it was something or other else, but I lost nearly all of the ones in that jar that had it. But it could have just been that it had a big um, water change in one go and I should have done smaller amounts. I don't know. There was so much that I didn't know, so much that Every I tried. Right? And, yeah, but the ocean water was the first lot. Um, I don't think I, because I'm now only using um, synthetic um, and that's working fine in my both my tanks. So I don't think I'd bother with ocean water again. Um, but as I said, that was what they'd started with. So I figured that would have all the stuff that they needed. So I kept going with it until I couldn't be bothered anymore. <laughs> Well, for my the, the simpler methods that I did uh, my talk around, uh, I don't know, that maybe is $200 value of stuff, not counting maybe the salt. I used a lot of old things that I already had on hand to try and make it uh, as simple as possible, like a scrungy old 10 gallon tank. and. Um, but for my large scale attempts that I've been doing, I've spent thousands. And uh, that's probably poor planning on my part, over planning, trying too many things, um, you know, buying every food that could conceivably be eaten by them just to try and cover all the bases. Once I get it down, I think it'll be a lot less. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? I'd say mine was Cost. probably 50 to 100 because I did it at such small scale, you know, using plastic crab attacks and um, air stones that I bubbled um, using pumps and, you know, tried different foods, different, you know, fish flakes. And so I didn't spend a fortune on mine. I can ask you this after your talk, but I'm super curious. I can't wait. Um, how did you get that incredible microscope footage? Can you just explain that? We basically, I just had a camera and we bought a special attachment that hooked up to my microscopes. And um, it that's, microscope. it was a special microscope camera, I guess. So you put the individual under the microscope and then- right. I spent hours under the microscope. So I have like hours and hours and hours of footage. <laughs> so yeah. I can't imagine, but you picked the best ones for sure. <laughs> Well, thank you very talk. much. You gave um, me the impetus to put it all together. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> I am so thrilled it's out there. Um, I'm trying to look at other questions. If anyone else sees a question they want to answer, feel free. I'm just going to scroll for a minute. I've just recently bought this. It was on sale at um, your answer and it, it just plugs into the USB on the computer. It's got a light. Hang on. Oh, I haven't charged it. Um, it's, got, it's got LED lights and it's a microscope type thing. I haven't actually used it yet. I've only literally just bought it. But uh, that was for hopefully to get better photos of my crabs. Yeah, it's, it's a Celestron. I don't know, can you see that? Oh, it's in reverse, isn't it? <laughs> I tried that guy. I couldn't make it work, but I'm... 10 I'm not to... Uh, Tammy, there's a question for you that I pinned over to the top of the chat. Um, actually, I didn't have the success that Mary has had. I had um, basically like 27, I think, Clypeatus, and I transferred 45 um, C. lila originally to my uh, 
see a land transition tank, but I think um, I ended up with like 21 or 28 of those. I can't remember. I don't have, have them on my notes right off the bat, but just a very small number. Um, whereas Mary's had vast success, which is neat because, you know, she'll have the ability to really impact the commercial market if she wants to do that. If we get buyers, if we get people, you know, adopters, sorry, if we get people who, who sign up. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm stuck with a thousand babies. And, uh, <laughs> no harm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I wish I could. Um, Darcy asked, uh, do we have a list of must have materials? I think that's a great question. Anyone? Lots of time and patience. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Lots of air, so that it, you've still got some left when you pulled it all out. I think Stacey right. Hall answered that. Uh, that oh, question. did she? I'm having a hard time getting through the scrolls in the right order. Thank it's you. also I answered in my talk. I, I have a, a list of minimum uh, materials in my talk, which is later today at noon. So if you want to catch that, um, you have your pen and write it down. I uh, mentioned, Rotifer, um, I, I've I had this I, question before. Go, I'm sorry, Sue, go ahead. I just say in my talk tomorrow night, or tomorrow morning, sorry, I mentioned some basic needs and um, got some pictures of some stuff. So people could, might like to that as well. How to do it on a How budget. How many did you keep in your jars? In my what? How many, did you, how many, Zoe, did you keep in your jars? Did you restrict the number or did you just put whatever you had in there? I put all of them into one jar to start with. I just basically tipped the pool into that jar. Then I siphoned probably about half of them out um, into a second jar, and then the next the next day I took probably two hundred or so out and put into a third jar. Um, but I have no idea how many I had. Um, there were there were thousands, I would say, because the water was. Swimmy things, um, but the numbers drop fairly quickly. Um, and I did a few things I, totally I, wrong and learnt big time by mistakes. But that's that also why it's good to have a couple jars, right? Yeah, With one yeah. jar guy still got more. Um, exactly. Curls sort of spread Germany had always. Girls in Germany had always said no more than 50 in her Chrysler. Um, and so I was just asking that question. Did you, Tammy, did you like try to keep them all alive or did you try to start with a fewer number? Um, I hatched as many as I could possibly hatch. Um, with the sea lila, I caught the female actually early in the morning and she was um, beginning to hatch some of her eggs and dump them in the sand. So unfortunately I, was only able to intercept a small number of hers. Um, but yeah, I would always try to hatch as many as I possibly could because it's kind of an odds, you know, you're playing the odds. Mm. For sure. Uh, there was a question about anyone has tried uh, feeding rotifers. I've had that question before. I've thought about it. I haven't done it. Anybody else tried rotifers? No. no. What are they? Uh, uh, I don't know. They're another small copepod, right? Uh, maybe Moa knows. What's a rotifer? Do you know Moa? No. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> well, I'm just going to, um, you know, describe it. Baby brine shrimp? Like yes. small yeah, I said baby brine shrimp. Nah, mine didn't like brine shrimp at all. Brine shrimp is not an easy thing for them to eat necessarily, so I definitely supplemented with other things like um, zooplankton. I would take powdered zooplankton and phytoplankton and mix a little bit of salt water to kind of turn it into a liquid slurry and then drop that in the water. 
and then do water changes after they had had a chance to feed. Yeah, I did that too. I found it actually really helpful to put a lot of live Artemia in at night so I could turn the light off and forget about them and they could still feed and it wouldn't be food that was going to foul the water necessarily. It's living food. I think it's good for them to catch, practice hunting and catching their own food. And I found that I could add, you know, uh, one millimeter or milliliter pipette in there, like five of those. And in the morning, I saw almost no brine shrimp, but I saw a lot of really orange bellies. So that helped a lot. I didn't do that on day one, usually because I didn't have time to hatch the brine shrimp and have them ready. But by day two or three, usually by day three, I was doing that. Um, and they, it seemed to it seemed to make a big difference. And I also did like you, Tammy. I did the final plan and the gonio power, which is a zooplankton. I did marine snow at night too because that figure either the artemia will eat that or the um, or the uh, zoe will. And you know, it's it's fairly. I think it's mostly inorganic material, so I didn't I didn't worry too much about that. And we have about 10 minutes left, so I am, and this has been recorded, so we, anyone who's watching this or wants to tell someone else who missed it, uh, when we get playbacks uh, enabled, you will be able to, to see this to get your information again. Um, uh, yep, there is the schedule of maintenance. I have that in my talk. I, I tried to do everything just it's, it's a super simple talk. It's not gorgeous like anybody else's, but it's very much broken down the simplest detailed pres um, prescription of everything. Um, and I didn't follow that 100%, but I know people like a roadmap. They like a simple roadmap. So I just tried to distill it all into something that I think will work if that's all you can do. Um, and you may not have the huge success rate, but I think you should have uh, a some amount of success. So so yeah, that will be in my talk in, in just a, a half hour. I better go soon. <laughs> Collect myself. Um, Jessica asked about testing the water levels for nitrogen. I don't know about the rest of you guys. It was all I, yes, when I could, it was all I could do to do what I knew I had to do. If I was worried about it, it was always easier just to do a quick water change than it was to try and measure and adapt. And and the, and I could tell like they would get sluggish or they would drop to the bottom. You know, like I just, I followed their cues. If they looked like they were not happy, I tried to make them happy. And the fastest way to do that was to do a partial water change. Anyone else measure for nitrogen? nitrogen Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. In my first attempt, I did uh, test the water, but I'm I'm terrible with that wa water chemistry and and all that, and I, I had no idea what I was doing. So I figured, you know, I'd follow, you know, the water makeup that I'm used to following, and I changed the water uh, one third at a time every six to eight hours, depending on their activity. And if there was a mass malt, I'd have to change that water you know, much sooner than what I was used to, just to get them through it. Because you do you Definitely. do see that once that water starts to foul, they slow down. It, you know, it's, it's not nice. I think we uh, ways head off the they don't eat for a couple of days. Uh, ways to inspire them to spawn in the salt water. I, I have, um, I think it depends on your crab, Darcy. Um, I, I have also had to learn when I have, I have a couple of clypeatus that love to spawn in the freshwater. And my freshwater uh, pool is a tank that is cycled. And I really don't want to, it's just a horrible when I get, 10,000 eggs in there that start to stink. So I've learned to cover the fresh water, which deters them from that, pushes them to the salt water. 
I personally have found, now this may be completely different for species or just personal crab preference, I found that fresh water, freshly mixed salt water makes a difference. Um, uh, warmer temperatures make a difference. And I actually have had the most success putting one of those little 78 degree heaters in my saltwater pool. Um, it, I don't think it's necessary for the Zoe, but I think it encourages the female to say, oh, this is nice warm water or to not go, ah, you know, and um, and it didn't, I thought it would zap the Zoe in there. They, they hit it, they swim, that doesn't kill them. So those are the things that I found. Any, anybody else, Sue says a storm, can you manage? Let's have a storm for it. Yeah. I just basically kept my females, and I would, um, you know, when they're getting close to ready to hatch, they would tend to, eggs would loosen, and I would find them on the carapace, and then I would, you know, kind of play, you know, try to hatch them in salt water and test whether or not they're viable at that point. But And I would find females that would, of course, hatch in the freshwater dish, unfortunately, and, and the saltwater dish, but... Yeah, no. The guy in um, my Taiwan. Sorry, you go. That's okay. Just, I was just gonna say the guy in Taiwan who is doing uh, rugosis right now um, puts his female in a bin, a plastic bin that she can't get out of that has maybe only that much water, and she spawned in that. So go ahead. So with my first attempt, my female had dumped on the sub, so it was in the food dish. Uh, on a ramp, a cork ramp that I had leading into the salt pool. Um, and I, I was like, what do I do? So I ended up hatching them, popping them in the salt water and they were fine. With my other attempts, I've seen the girl go straight into the salt pool. Um, the girl that has the most babies, Laurel, she often sits on the side of the salt pool just before it's time to release them. So I know, you know, around that 27, 28 day mark, I need to make fresh water to make sure that she's going to definitely go in that salt pool. So otherwise, you know, she could dump it on the sub again. And, and the one thing I found out with my, my pool, with, uh, if anybody looks at uh, Courtney Carr's presentation about a bioactive crab attack from CrabCon, last year like, watching that video i was like wow i really need to do something more with my water pool so i watched the water portion of that maybe 20 times to set up my pools and i found that like with my salt water pool i, I made a ledge maybe an inch below the surface of the water and if the crabs don't really like to submerge and actually go swimming, they spend an awful lot of time on that ledge. And I, I think that like with the females, especially when they're traipsing around the tank, walking all over the place, they'll find that ledge. And I think that might encourage them to go into the water further to release the eggs rather than having a full drop off in the water. I think that we have just two minutes left. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to stay if uh, if it ends. If we can't, I just want to invite all of you, please, to uh, the, the Q&A for my breeding talk after it airs. Um, if you want to come in there and help me answer questions with things that you have found that work or species that are different than what I've succeeded with, uh, please do come in there. You can you can. Uh, help me type and keep up with questions. That would be awesome. And I'm going to scoot, but please finish and see if you can keep going. I just have to do a couple of administrative things. So thank you, everyone. Thank keep you, on, Mary. Keep it on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, does anybody else use UV lighting for their Zoea? No, no. I use an aquarium light for my my Zoe, um, only because I don't have a UV light. If I had the setup for it, I would probably opt for the UV over the aquarium light. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I had I, I, I had UV purely by the sun coming in through the window in the laundry. Yeah. Um, I didn't have any lights at all um, other than the sunlight. Me too. Yeah, just natural daylight. And then I would use like a desk lamp to draw the Zoe, uh, um, Zoe to the edge for feeding. That helped, to, you know, for them to feed better. Yeah, like, like using lights was amazing. That's how I, when I when I was exchanging them from the salt from, from the bowl to the new one, I would use a little flashlight on the side of the jar, and they would all gravitate towards that. And then I could scoop out a fifty or a hundred at a time, and that worked really, really well. Yeah, it's also a good way to do a water change too, because you've got them all drawn over to the light. And then you can siphon out water on the opposite side of the tank. Yeah. Yeah, which I actually I, got some cool video of that as well. I didn't find mine were particularly reactive to the light. I tried that, but it didn't seem to make a great deal of difference. Yeah. I, mine seems to behave a lot like a brine shrimp. So if you're breeding brine shrimp, they do travel towards the light, um, you know, to get the food or whatever it is that they're doing uh mine did go towards the light but in the room that i was trying to raise mine and i don't have any windows so the only light was the artificial light yes yeah, see i mine was in the laundry which has got a yeah. great big window in the thing and it's quite a light bright room it's also quite warm in summer so that's another reason why i put it there yeah. and didn't have it. the floor got wet <laughs> Now, how, how long did you guys all have your crabs before they started mating? About seven months. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe my strawberries I had about a year. And it, and but I did get a rescue off of some someone and I had her maybe six months and I got her with like a deformed leg from a bad molt and she bounced back within six months and uh she was the one that i actually filmed in my video that uh had the eggs that's awesome i had two for ages and ages and then i added another three crabs to the tank and it was probably six months after that that i actually had the first lot of eggs so i think it's got to do with numbers as well yeah. I don't know, that, you know, just as I said, I'd had the two for three years um, and hadn't had any eggs. And there was one female and one male. Um, and one of the original ones was one of the ones that produced eggs. So um, I don't know, maybe they just didn't get along. <laughs> yeah, my um, Indonesian blueberries, I had just gotten a small colony. And my female, um, I, she, she must have come in pregnant, I'm guessing. She must have already had eggs. So um, I thought that was kind of interesting. And I got her maybe, uh, I'm not sure if it was the end of January or beginning of February. And, you know, that's an unusual time for her mm -hmm. Cinebita to, to mate, too, and to actually have eggs. That's really interesting. I had mine for a year and a half and that's when they started to sort of show that mating behaviour. But it wasn't until two years ago when I'd had them for nearly three years that they actually started to mate and produce eggs and, and the babies. Sort and of then laugh. they didn't stop. Yeah, and then they didn't stop. <laughs> Helena had so many lots of eggs, it was getting a bit embarrassing wasn't it it was horrible all four girls were gravid at the same time and one would release eggs and then she would get eggs again and it was just this constant cycle and they were prolific it was terrible <laughs> i told her she needed to put mcdreamy into iso yeah to give the a break. <laughs> have any of you ever noticed um i've had situations where I've had most of the eggs are like a nice bright rich orange color and then I've had um, clutches where they're real pale and 
almost more yeah. like pinky salmon color. Have you ever experienced that? I have. I had um, one lot that looked like that, and it turned out that they weren't fertilized. Oh. Um, so I don't know what it was like with yours if they ended up, you know, being uh, viable, but mine weren't when they were that color. That may very well be what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I have yet to see females with eggs. I have yet to see mating behavior as well. I'm a very hands-off person with my crabs. Um, as I said, I didn't even know I had eggs until I saw stuff in the oh my god, what is that? Wow. So you were really caught off guard. I was totally, totally unprepared. That's awesome Absolutely. that you were successful under those circumstances. It wasn't the first time, it was the second time, and I was just as unprepared because I didn't know, but the female had started behaving strangely. And she, would go, she would go to the edge of the pool and then go away and then go back. And so she'd been doing that for about 12 hours, and I was sort of getting a bit suspicious. And then we had the big storm, and voila, I actually went, saw those eggs probably half an hour after they were laid wow. because I checked at midnight before I went to bed and there was things swimming around in my salt water pool again. <laughs> Thank heavens to Natalie. She just, you know, as you'll see in my talk, she just um, helped me through and she's the other lady in Australia who has um, achieved success. So what species have all of you guys hatched? I know you're... You've done variabilis, right, Sue? And yep, that's all. You're variabilis? Yes. What about you? Uh, Rugosis. Okay. And then? I, I, I've only had strawberries. Wow. That's great. Actually, I'm, I'm actually thinking about talking to the guys. I buy my crabs at a shop in Brisbane, which is a three-hour drive. Um, but they keep them in good conditions or whatever. And I'm actually thinking of making a, um agreement with the guy if he gets any females with eggs, which he may well do because of the conditions he keeps them in, um, I'll drive all the way up, get them and raise them and then give him the female back. That's great. And, and any of the babies that he wants um, I, next time I go up. But I can't get into Queensland at the moment. Now the borders are about to open though. Yes, but it's an hour drive for me from home to the border. Mm. But by the time I get about half an hour, no, about 45 minutes up, I will be sitting in the queue for uh, yeah, of hours. Yeah. I use 20, 20, meter, 20 kilometres long to cross the border. That's crazy. Yeah, that's, that's like three quarters of the way from my place to the border is about where the queue starts and then it's another two hours up to Brisbane. So I'm not going just yet. So do any of you use filters? I saw Christy ask um, about filters and changing the pools. I don't use filters. Uh, I just use the air stones and change the water, uh, about a third of the water uh, at each change. Yeah. I said you mean the babies i set up a saltwater fish tank originally and they would the babies would get sucked up through the return vent so then i put yeah. a real fine micron mesh net on it but it just it's so much easier just doing little individual crab attacks and doing air stones and you know then you're able to do frequent water changes and i've had much better success that way yeah Just trying to see if there's any other questions here. But my my screen seems to have frozen a bit. I put a small version of this in one of my jars. And it's it's basically just a very soft foam. It's a biofilter. Um and a whole pile of the babies got stuck up onto it and didn't survive. I killed everything in that jar. <laughs> so 
something I learned not to use. And that that was a filter. But I'll have to be careful because I have I've got a, actually got a cycle three litre um, pool in my adult tank at the moment. So I'll have to check very carefully because that's got a filter and a little waterfall and stuff. So the babies won't survive that. Why I feel those don't work. I'm just going to refresh my page for a second because I'm having some issues. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, she's gone. <laughs> Us Aussies talk a lot, don't we? <laughs> Anybody else have hey, anything? <laughs> is it your tank behind you, Dan? Uh, yeah, this is two of them. We have uh, a 55, which this is all rescue crabs. And we actually have one, which she's a monster in it and then we have a 65 gallon tall over here and then we actually have our crabby nursery which actually there's two crabs currently mating in it wow. so let me try to take a walk over to that crab porn <laughs> <laughs> if it works I don't know if I can get because I have to hold my. Can't really see. I see a mirror. Um, and where are they? Right up the back? No, like in the corner right behind. I can't hear you. Um, I don't know if you can see them. Are they in the crab pit? Like All the right. Flowers? I don't know if you can see them. I'm trying to move it to different. Are areas. they in the clay pot there? Yeah, I think so. Okay. No, I'm behind the pot. Maybe. Oh, yeah, I see them now. But this is. Are they tension rods in there, Dan? Yeah, they are. I've heard about them. I've not seen them, though. Yeah, yeah they're tension rods, and then uh, we just wrap them in. Can't hear you. <laughs> no. Yeah, uh, they're, they're uh, tension rods, and... We just wrap them in jute, which we have them in all of our jutes. Yeah, they offer so much um, op different options. I might see get some. Yeah, our, you know, our, our, our crabs love climbing on them all over. They're, they're great. So her laptop's not coming back. Yeah. Just in chat. What time does the next... Yeah. Good heavens, it's quarter to 2 a.m. here. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> I didn't realise it was quite fun. I've been having fun. <laughs> yep, it's amazing how you lose time talking about crabs. I'm retired, so it doesn't matter. It's worth it. <laughs> what time is it for you, Ma? Um, 17.44. What's that? Um, 
five, five four, 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 almost six um, p.m. I think. <laughs> on what, on what day? Saturday. What? On Saturday? Yes. Yeah. It's now Sunday morning here. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think I'm going to sign off now because it's almost lunchtime here. So <laughs> I'm going to go and watch Mary's thing at two o'clock and then I'll go to sleep, I think. <laughs> nice talking with all of yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, it has been interesting. Yeah, good. Bye. <laughs> right. See ya. Bye. <laughs>